Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, the origins of emojis, the origins of filmmaking and the Egyptian mood treatment. We'll look at the fantastical work of pioneering film director Georges Méliès. Middle East and North Africa's cultural heritage bears the brunt of war. In Egypt, the oud helps people play away the pandemic blues. Before mega blockbuster cinema and million dollar special effects, there was Georges Méliès, an illusionist turned filmmaker. When cinema was in its infancy, he pioneered a wide variety of film techniques. Come along as Showcase's Ali Jam Pamir takes you into the world of cinema's first great fantasy filmmaker. Born in 1861, Georges Méliès was the son of a well-to-do family who owned a shoe factory. After finishing his studies, he was sent to London to improve his English. And it was there he developed his lifelong passion, stage magic. So much so that a few years later, he sold his shares in the family business and bought a theater in Paris. Milliers was at the first public cinema screening, held by Lumiere Brothers on December 28, 1895, and immediately offered to buy one of the siblings' cameras. They declined. So he returned to England, bought a film projector, and with a few modifications, turned it into a camera. Eventually, Milliers built his own studio, entirely made of glass like a greenhouse, to allow light needed for filming. And it was there he made his films, which he would later screen in his theater. His productions, which often incorporated stage magic, were mostly fantasy tales, set within impressively imaginative sets, which Méliès designed and built. He also pioneered cinema techniques like double exposure, which combines two separate images into a single image, as well as the jump cut, a now common editing technique that allows for an abrupt transition between moments. His films were a success with audiences around the globe. It's reported that filmmakers like Thomas Edison bootlegged his films and made money off these illegal copies. During the First World War, Milliez's studio was turned into a hospital, and his movies were among its casualties. Hundreds of his films were melted by the army, because at the time, the silver found in celluloid film was used to produce the heels of military boots. In the end, Méliès became bankrupt and made a living managing a toy and candy shop in the Montparnasse railway station. But in the late 1920s, thanks to film journalists who were interested in his innovations and unique style, Méliès was rediscovered and later awarded the Legion of Honor by his country. It is estimated that before passing away in 1938, Milliers made more than 500 films. The Lumiere brothers called him the creator of the cinematic spectacle. Walt Disney also paid him tribute, saying he was one of the pioneers who discovered the means of placing poetry within the reach of the common man. Georges Méliès's surviving films are still an amazing feat to behold. And within these cinematic delights, 
one can see the birth of the foundations of the blockbusting fantasy epics of today. For more on this, let's welcome film historian Ian Christie. Hi Ian, good to have you on Showcase with us today. So, um, we keep saying that Georges Méliès is one of the creators of filmmaking, of cinema as we know it today. But then uh, there are some other names uh, who are given the same title as well. So tell us uh, what is his uh, role exactly in, in the history of filmmaking? Well, uh, Georges Méliès was one of the very first people who turned up to see the Lumiere brothers show their cinematograph uh, on the 28th of December 1895. And uh, he said immediately, I want to buy one <laughs> because he was a magician and he felt that he could uh, use this new device to make magic on the, in his theatre. Uh, they wouldn't sell to him. And so um, he went to London and actually he bought his first equipment from Robert Paul the English pioneer and, in a way, the rival of the Lumiere brothers. Mm -hmm. And um, do you think his role in the history of filmmaking is recognized enough? Or would you maybe call him a bit underrated compared to Lumiere brothers, for example? Oh, I would definitely call him underrated compared with the Lumieres. <laughs> the Lumieres, I think, get way too much credit. Uh, yes, their cinematograph was a real breakthrough, but, you know, it, they didn't really make very interesting films. Um, they produced these little scenes of everyday life, but Méliès's vision of what cinema could be was way beyond that. And he was the first to really make the cinema, as we know it today, full of fantasy. Uh, he made uh, historical reconstructions of the, the Dreyfus Affair, which is a big scandal in France. But above all, he made fantasy. And if we think that cinema today is very much about creating magical, fantastic worlds, then Méliès is the father of cinema. Interesting. Why do you think he is underrated then? Most of his films were lost. That was the first problem. Uh, it's a real problem with early cinema right across the world. Um, most of the films, they just weren't considered important. And they all kind of disappeared. And I remember back in the last century, the very, very few of Méliès's films were even known. Now we're discovering more and more and more of them, and we're getting a much better kind of understanding of it. And then, of course, there was Martin Scorsese, who made his great film, Hugo, which is really all about Méliès. And I think that film is, is the best way to introduce Méliès and his importance you know, to, to a large audience today. So, Ian, you say that uh, most of his films are lost, but do, do you know about how much of it do we have, uh, we have access to today? Oh, we have uh, access to a lot more than we did have because they keep being rediscovered. I mean, the great thing is that when people realized just how, how fantastic Méliès was, they started looking and the films keep turning up. And what we see in his films, uh, you know, the ones that we have access to, are all fairy tales of the previous centuries. I wonder why you think that is. Well, Méliès was, a, you know, a man of the theatre. Um, he'd grown up... Um, with the magic theatre, which was a big thing in the 19th century. And he was used to doing illusions, fantastic illusions, which involved dressing up in costume. So the fairy tales, Cinderella, uh, Beauty and the Beast, uh, stories like Faust, these were all you know, part of his world. So when he started making films, that's naturally what he made films about. And um, it's funny because we're watching a completely new medium take shape, the cinema, but what we're seeing are stories from the past. And mm -hmm. it's a kind of paradox. Yeah, it is a paradox. And uh, speaking of the technicality of his, of his uh, movies, why don't you tell us about uh, the special effects that he used? And um, I mean, you know, that is the novelty, I guess, in his story. Well, really, he was the inventor of many of the special effects, which are still used in filmmaking today, uh, even if they're done electronically today. Very simple idea. You run the camera, you stop it, you change something, and then you start it again. Uh, it's magic. Something disappears. Um, and then it, the picture keeps changing, as if by magic. Méliès was one of the first people to do that. The other great uh, device that he exploited a lot was superimposing one picture over another. So he would film a scene, he would wind the film back, and then he would film another scene on top of it, wind it back, 
And he would do that maybe six or seven times. Incredible precision needed to make it work. But when it works, it really is magic. And are these techniques um, sort of the ones that we're using today, or is that a bit too much to say? No, no, they, they are. <laughs> it's uh, when you see, you know, a superhero film today. What you're seeing is a number of different images layered on top of one another, and that's done digitally, electronically today. But essentially, it's the same technique that Méliès was using right back at the beginning of the last century. Uh, it's it's the basis of all film magic: um, stopping the camera, starting it again and superimposing layer after layer on top of a picture. It's, it's really what makes the difference between you know, simple photography and film magic, film fantasy. Mm -hmm. And as a film historian, Ian, please talk us through who, which important filmmakers he inspired the most. Well, you know, I think he inspired uh, filmmakers all over the world because his films were tremendously popular. In the first years of the, of the 20th century, his films were really highly valued. They were expensive, more expensive than other films to buy, and everybody saw them. So he created a whole genre of film fantasy. In England, uh, he certainly had a big influence on Robert Paul, who was the founder of British cinema. I've just written a book about him. Um, and they had a very close kind of, I think, rivalry. <laughs> I think they were trying to egg each other on. You know, if I do this, can you do one better? Uh, Segundo de Chaumont, a great Spanish-born filmmaker who became one of the absolute pioneers of special effects in slightly later cinema. He took inspiration from Méliès as well. And Stuart Blackton, who was the pioneer of animation in America, he was also inspired by Méliès. All right, Ian, uh, very quickly before we wrap up, obviously Trip to the Moon is very famous, but then what other movies can you uh, recommend us to watch, actually? I mean, I've never watched uh, uh, his movies, so what is a good start? <laughs> Well, um, Journey Across the Impossible is a fantastic film that, that goes just as far and even further than Trip to the Moon. Um, I think uh, The One Man Band is an extraordinary film. It's, it's really a film in which he himself, Georges Méliès, plays seven different parts. So what you see in One Man Band is seven little images of Méliès all playing a musical instrument. Mm -hmm. And that's an example of what he could do just by you know, rewinding the film. And oh. the other thing, of course, a great film is Conquest of the Pole, which is one of his later films. That's, that's a fantastic piece of work. All right. All noted. Thanks a lot, Ian, for joining us on Showcase today. Lovely to talk to you. My pleasure. Thank you. Despite having dozens of platforms to communicate with these days, many of us use emojis to share our emotions. Whether we're sad or happy, angry or confused, we all know there is a little icon to reflect that. But for some people, emojis are more than just smiley faces. For communication with friends, it's a huge part to the point that it's kind of scary. A face with tears of joy, another one with folded hands and sparkles. These are just some of the most popular emojis out there. But for some people, these miniature characters don't just deliver a message, they also represent who they are. In a positive way. If there are four emojis to represent the mailbox, why on earth isn't there one to represent the half a billion Muslims that wear the headscarf? When Rayouf Alhumedi couldn't find a tiny digital picture, which represented herself and the more than 550 million women worldwide who wore the hijab, she wanted to do something about it. So four years ago, when she was 15 years old, the Saudi Arabian girl submitted a proposal for a hijab emoji. Thanks to her efforts, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum acquired the, quote, person wearing a headscarf emoji in 2017 to help broaden representation and diversity. The world sees me as a woman wearing the headscarf, so it felt appropriate to also have that as a representation. But obviously there was nothing like it, so I decided to creatively go around it and use the turban guy emoji arrows and, you know, a girl with her hair emoji just to indicate I'm a girl that has wears a combination of a head wrap. And, you know, the thoughts spiraled from there on why isn't there one? And now there is one. Katrina Parrott was inspired to create emojis with diverse skin tones after her daughter complained that there was nothing out there that represented what she looked like. 
everybody was feeling the lack in the emojis that they had on that platform. So we did African American skin tone. We did Native. Uh, we did uh, Asian, Caucasian, folks from India and Hispanics, and and those who were uh, Latino and Hispanic. So we covered all of the bases. There are trillions of these. The emoji story explores the origins of the icons that are now a part of our daily lives. And as you watch the documentary, remember that the person with headscarf and interracial couple emojis are more than just mini digital icons. They're an illustration of the desire by people from around the world to be represented and to be seen. Bullet holes in ancient structures are just one example of how decades of conflict is threatening architectural sites across the Middle East and North Africa. Nursan Atutar has more about how the history of the region is in danger of disappearing. One of humankind's oldest settlements lies in the MENA region. The countries of the Middle East and North Africa are rich in historical sites and ruins that belong to a variety of cultures and civilizations, past and present. However, decades of conflict have left many ancient monuments in danger of complete ruin. And now, local historians as well as residents are pleading with authorities to help preserve and repair the sites. I'm appealing to the Libyan government to consider the issue of restoring this city and to install a large fence for it, and for the archaeological sites, whether it is Kaha Palace or the other shrines here. Libya, for example, contains many ancient sites, including citadels built by both Greek and Roman empires some dating back as far as 620 BC. Menelaus, from Homer's epic poems The Iliad and the Odyssey, travelled through these lands on his return home after fighting in the Trojan War. The sites have been richly and wonderfully depicted throughout ancient literature, but today many of them are littered with bullet holes. This is a Roman settlement known as Boroum in eastern Libya, referred to by locals as Bugrada. Most of it has never been excavated, still lying under the sand, waiting to be unearthed. And like Yemen, the rest of the region has a similar story. Insufficient funds and never-ending armed conflict make the reconstruction efforts both slow and painstaking. Moving on to Egypt now, pottery has been at the core of that country's craft making for as long as its history has been recorded. And there is one small village that has kept that tradition alive against all odds. Fadi Francis is an artist and journalist, but his passion for the arts started way before his interest in journalism. Born in Luxor, he was raised by a mother who was an artist and a father who was an Egyptologist. He says the grand architecture, temples and monuments of Luxor have influenced his art immensely. And although he's been dabbling with drawing for most of his life, it was only recently he discovered a talent for sculpting, by accident. In 2018, by mere chance, I started making forms from the white ceramic paste and discovered I have a talent for sculpting. This really encouraged me to develop myself and learn new forms of art. I started watching videos, I started studying and reading about sculpting and decided to focus on thermal clay. In late 2018, I started my project. Around that time, Francis moved to Cairo and began studying fine arts on his own, in addition to working as a journalist. But with the pandemic taking its toll of the practice of journalism, this is what he's doing most days now, 
carving and coloring in every minute detail of these clay models. So far, Francis has completed 82 pieces, including Pope Francis, Steve Jobs and Diego Maradona. And even the elderly Mr. Fredrickson from the Disney Pixar animation Up. I did gladly choose the characters from countries all over the world, from Latin America, Europe, Asia and Africa. Diversity is very important to me. What's also important is that they work in different fields. While the pandemic has affected businesses, economies and all aspects of life as we know it, Francis says during this period he's thriving. He says he plans to finish the series in the next two months and then exhibit it to the public. The oud, a stringed instrument whose origins date back thousands of years, is a key element of classical Arabic music. But in Egypt, its sweet sounds have begun attracting music lovers, hoping to overcome their pandemic-induced boredom. Oud makers across Egypt are busier than ever these days. That's because the demand for the instrument has gone up ever since the COVID-19 crisis broke out. Now, people care for the oud in an extraordinary way, especially during the times of coronavirus. Many oud makers did very well during the pandemic because people stayed home and got bored. So they ordered a huge number of ouds online. Many of those orders were from the Kipa Music School, which only opened earlier this year. Although the school teaches its students other instruments as well, the oud has been the most popular among all. But even if the coronavirus has somehow created more spare time in people's lives, for the school's founder, the real reason why people don't often take up this kind of hobby has nothing to do with having the time or the desire. The problem isn't the desire or the time. The problem is the need. In our Eastern society, music is marginalized. So it is considered nonsense to use up part of your income to learn the U. But researchers say the sound of the oud reduces stress and anxiety. So that's why it might actually be a fruitful investment in these difficult times. On the other hand, if you do start learning it, you might end up developing new obsessions. Each type of wood produces a different sound. It's a fact that walnut and sesame wood give a nostalgic sound for those who don't want a loud oud sound. Some people now demand from me a very specific sound. They send me videos to ask what kind of wood and size gives that sound. This is one of the most difficult parts of manufacturing ouds. It comes with long experience. From its making to its playing, both require long hours. And since the pandemic is still in full swing and shows no signs of letting up, now might be the perfect time for the oud to become more popular and more played than ever. We're almost done with this edition of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. You can find more of our arts and culture stories on our YouTube channel, as well as our Twitter and Instagram feeds. But before we leave, let's go to the eastern part of Turkey, where people are taking advantage of some unexpected weather. It's a very exciting, different feeling. It's not like riding a bike on land. When you look over the lake, you can see the water under the ice layer. Do 
As you can see, it's completely safe, and the ice is thick enough. But we're now waiting for the snow, so that the horses can walk on the ice comfortably.